So I wanted to introduce you to Javier today because he wrote a paper recently on a, um, an emerging markets company that we're all familiar with. And um, this company had a scandal that, that kind of shook the industry. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today and the, the implications for especially ESG investing in emerging markets. So um, Javier, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you end up here? Where did you, you know, where were you before? And, and uh, just give us a little intro. Thank you, Bert, for the introduction. So I'm from Bolivia originally. I went to law school in Bolivia. Actually, while I was doing law school, I did an exchange in Brazil. That's how I honed my Portuguese. Afterwards, I was awarded a full scholarship to do an LLM here at Columbia University here in New York. So I came to do that. And after that, I, I started working at the Human Rights Foundation. So I've always tried to combine my, my appreciation of political freedom with also some uh, economic analysis. And now in the context of a uh, JD degree that I'm pursuing at Fordham Law School in the evenings, I, I wrote this paper for the Journal of Corporate and Financial Law at, uh, at Fordham. Okay, great. So this paper talks about Petrobras, which is very, very commonly owned in um, emerging markets, indexes, and funds. Um, we do not currently hold any Petrobras in um, the Life and Liberty Emerging Markets Index, um, but we're going to talk about, so tell us what happened with this scandal and, and, and what, how do they find out about this? So back in 2014, yeah. they start investigating this small car wash in Brazilia. They, okay. In Spanish, the name of the car wash was Lava Jato. And uh, as part of that, that, that ends up, they had just passed some reform that allowed for, for prosecutors to use plea bargains in order to incentivize uh, investigated people to actually rat their friends, right? Like the people okay. that they have been in. In, 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 in corruption schemes with. Yeah. So they get to someone very important very quickly, and this, then this investigation turns into the largest corruption investigation, probably in world history, there have been people that have been comparing wow. it with what happened in ancient Rome on, on certain <laughs> cases, uh, uh, and uh, definitely ended up being the largest um, fraud, mass uh, class action, fr fraud, uh, securities litigation uh, class action by investors here in the U.S. by a foreign issuer ever. Measure, measured by what? The settlement size? Yeah, the okay. settlement size. Okay. So the settlement size ended up being of around three billion dollars, two point ninety five wow. billion dollars. Okay. Uh, this this is a, a system that is, as, as as probably most of your listeners know, it's driven by by plaintiff lawyers. So it's mm -hmm. essentially uh, a plaintiff firm that gets together with most of the pension funds and, and that own okay. stock. So at, that's how that it company. works in the U.S. That's how it works in okay. the U.S. And that's part of the overall U.S. anti-fraud, anti-securities fraud system. So okay. it's that's the sort of the private side and there's the SEC side. In this case, first thing that came out was the scandal within Brazil because CEOs of most constructors of Petrobras mm -hmm. uh, is, confessed that they have been bribing the company for dozens of years uh well for for around 14 years yeah and uh and and they went to jail some of them as part of their of the sort of uh, uh preliminary investigations and they right. ratted everyone out and then this led to and we can talk about that later a little bit odebrecht the odebrecht side that made this scandal not just a scandal of brazil and of petrodas but it made very clear that these construction companies were bribing people all so, over the world so and definitely all over life. skim off the top themselves the other way around yeah so essentially oh, so, okay so they're yeah, being bribed so okay. exa exactly okay. petro has been the largest company in brazil and in the context of brazil uh, brazil's role in the world cup and in the olympics and all that they constructed yeah a lot over a few a few years and this led to the growth of a few i mean they were all already big construction companies in brazil i'm talking odebrecht oas mm -hmm. uh uh, uh Quiroz Galvão. There, there are several big construction companies in brazil that were involved in this scheme uh, it was a, an unprecedented scandal scandal for because for the first time ceos of these companies were actually being investigated and spending time in jail uh while wow. the investigations were ongoing um, so this would be like if Mark Zuckerberg were sitting in jail exactly. being investigated for Facebook? Okay. The social effect for this is like one day you turn on the TV and both Bezos and Zuckerberg and Gates <laughs> and everyone is going to jail essentially okay. uh, and, and there's proof and there are testimony and paper okay. trails of a scandal that has been going on. For example, one of these companies ended up uh, confessing to having even bribed uh, something to the extent of $800 million over 14 years to 12 governments in Latin America in construction deals. And this brought down several former presidents, 
uh, no, sitting presidents, definitely Peru was particularly affected with this. The scandal is ongoing. They just, they just leaked, I think, a thousand uh, documents from this bribe division in Odebrecht. So all of these was part of the, I mean, started with a small investigation in Brasilia. Once Petrobras got involved, it became a huge scandal and it's a Latin America wide scandal. The interesting side of it is also that there was a combination here of prosecuting prosecutors actions in Brazil and then private litigation that got in the SEC that got in on top of that and the DOJ all of which I mean the DOJ based on FCPA Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, violations the SEC uh, complementing a little bit the the, the 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 fraud the private fraud side that yeah. the private litigation had uncovered. so all this started with a investigation of a car wash for exactly. money laundering mm -hmm. and then came down to being the biggest scandal exactly. um, and affected 12 governments, you said? 12 governments, 12 governments, 12 governments in Latin America. Ex-presidents exactly. and so forth. So at, at the height of this, this was ranked the, the, the world's most ethical Ethical. oil and gas company <laughs> in the world in the world Not just uh, by a, a Swiss firm that does ESG ratings so um, and all this information is in the paper that I will include um, with this video so I just thought that was really interesting in that um, a lot of us in emerging markets investing are familiar with this scandal um, but we're not familiar with the fact that it was ranked so high on ESG uh, ratings um, in the midst of it and yeah this is something that's brought down as you can see here, you know, a lot of uh, heads of companies and heads of governments. Um, and sometimes, you know, with ESG in emerging markets, it's a little harder to do because some of that information is not as transparent, it's not as reliable as it is in developed markets. And this is something that we have talked about as well. Um, a lot of us hate on ESG on um, FinTwit. Uh, I dedicate this video to my favorite ESG haters out there. Um, but I think you have a point, especially in emerging markets where the information is just not as reliable or transparent. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So since we're here at a Human Rights Foundation, why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, you know the work of the Human Rights Foundation, just to close, and um, the Oslo Freedom Forum that you have So we're, we're, we're a human rights group uh, founded around 15 years ago, and what we do is focus in countries that lack basic political rights. So we don't do work in all 193 countries in the world. We don't pay attention to all 190. I mean, we do pay attention, but we don't, we're not sending communications, reports, yeah. videos. You about focus on the worst, most authoritarian. Correct. Regime. Which for us are around 93 around the world. Okay. Uh, half of them around are full-fledged dictatorships, like no free elections whatsoever. And the other half have some degree of competitiveness, but their regimes cannot be called anymore fully uh, democratic, and so they're, uh, co we call them competitive authoritarian regimes yep. drawing from some political science uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. So in those 93 countries, we're essentially uh, exposing all of the bad things that happen in those countries. Our hypothesis is that if you're a fairly free and democratic country and you have free elections and free media and an and, and independent judiciary, you, you can deal with most of your problems, including a lot of injustices and bad things that might be happening, torturing one, torturing one animal, very bad things, but yeah. you, can, you, can, you can, within your democratic system, deal with them somehow, as opposed to in a country that is ruled by an authoritarian regime, a lot of these public policy problems, even fighting corruption, are things that by definition are, gonna, are, not, are not gonna be done as efficiently and as transparently as they would be in a democracy. Okay. Part of the lack of virtue so, of dictatorships is just that, that the, the way they're organized tends to discourage transparency, uh, growth that are very important for markets. Yeah, so we've seen that in markets as well sure. with our research that the freer markets tend to be more dynamic and the more oppressed markets tend to be more stagnant because they just, they just can't get out of the, the cycle that they're in. So, so yeah, I really appreciate the work of the Human Rights Foundation and through them I have met so many amazing freedom fighters from all kinds of, all around the world. So, you know, Saudi Arabia, Syria, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, and they, and these guys are working with them, Venezuela, of course, and these guys are working with them to, to help bring the message of freedom um, to these places and, and, and also give them a platform so that people like us can learn about it as well. So. Um, if you're looking for an uh, organization to support over the holidays, the Human Rights Foundation is one that I highly recommend. And thank you so much for being Perfect. with us today. Thank you, Perth. Yeah. All right. Appreciate Thanks, it. guys.